So thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Jessica Lori. I'm the program director at the Interfaith Center at Miami University, and we're located in Oxford, Ohio. The Interfaith Center's mission is to unify people through relationship building, dialogue, and social action. And this evening, we have an educational program on Shaiva Tantra. And our special guest this evening is Ben Williams. And Ben is an intellectual historian focused on Indian religions and the history of Shaiva Tantra. He has received extensive training in Indian philosophy, literature, and aesthetics in Sanskrit sources. Ben currently serves as an assistant professor of Hinduism at Naropa University, where he serves as the faculty lead for a recently launched low residency MA program in yoga studies. So thank you so much for joining us, Ben. Thank you so much for inviting me and for having me and I'm very happy to be with you all and, and join this community for this conversation. Thank you. So we will get started. We're gonna do this kind of Q&A style. And I guess the, the first and probably most obvious question that, that folks are gonna to wanna to know is um, what is Shaiva Tantra? And could you tell us a little bit about maybe the view um, according to Shaiva Tantra? Sure. I can do my best. Um, Shaiva Tantra is a tantric tradition that emerged within um, the subcontinent of India, uh, one of many tantric traditions. Um, tantra itself is probably worth saying, classical tantra is something like a phase in which Buddhist traditions and many different Hindu forms of traditions moved through. And so Shaiva Tantra is a tantric tradition that's uh, centered around the deity Shiva. So Shaiva literally means belonging to or devoted to Shiva. Um, and Shiva is a deity that maybe many of you are familiar with. Um, it's, uh, there's many traditions in India, popular traditions that worship Shiva. Um, and you know, there's mythology surrounding Shiva. There's great literature where Shiva is a character in Sanskrit literature. Um, but Shaiva Tantra is specifically tantric tradition. Um, and so maybe to, to illuminate Shaiva Tantra and some of its core views, it might be good to just say what makes a, a tradition, a Shaiva tradition tantric versus other forms of Shaiva traditions. And so um, I, I will say before I, I kind of give some of the, the broad strokes of what makes a tradition tantric, a, a, you know, um, a tradition devoted to Shiva, a tantric Shaiva tradition, um, that uh, there's many different streams of tantric traditions that are devoted to Shiva and many different goddesses that are affiliated and associated with Shiva. Um, and so if they're devoted, if the goddess really comes into the center, even if it's a part of a broader Shaiva tradition, then it's called Shakta. And Shakta means devoted to Shakti, which is the divine power, the divine goddess. Um, what makes a tantric tradition versus maybe an earlier Shaiva tradition or um, a Shaiva religious tradition is um, a really a new body of scriptures and revelation that identify themselves as tantras. And they're really seen to go beyond earlier scriptures, including the Vedas. There's a kind of a recognition that the Vedas are these earlier foundational scriptures within Indian religion, within Hinduism, the history of Hinduism. There's an awareness that there's, there's an awareness of Patanjali and yoga and another tradition called Sankhya, which is very important for Patanjali that's in the background. There's an awareness of different ascetic traditions. There's awareness of the epics, but this, I, this canon, this new canon of scriptures is really exalted and understood to be something of a definitive revelation of these new teachings. Um, and they're primordial, but they emerge in a certain moment in history. So I say new, they're really seen to be taught by Shiva often, or they're kind of divinely revealed by the Godhead, but they're, they do emerge in a certain moment in history. And, 
that that's a really important part of tantric tradition. There's a kind of an emergence of a novel scriptural identity. And what they promise is a more comprehensive form of uh, enlightenment, illumination, and empowerment um, that is often presented as being also uh, not just more comprehensive, but uh, more direct or um, almost quicker in a certain sense, or more potent. Um, so you have this new body of scriptures, and one of the key aspects of what is taught in these scriptures are new forms of worshiping Shiva. The earliest Shaiva Tantras are uh, the earliest Shaiva Tantrikas or the, you know, the actual people practicing. Um, we're doing a lot of elaborate forms of worship of Shiva, Tantric forms of worship. And that involved installing Shiva and retinues of deities within mandalas deity installing uh, diagrams or de deity enthroning diagrams in forms of puja. So that's an aniconic worship of Shiva, not a, a murti of Shiva, not in the linga, but in this deity enthroning diagram, which is a mandala, which many of you are probably familiar with and have seen different images of, including in Tibetan Buddhism. Um, there's a novel use and understanding of mantra Mantra is a speech act which changes reality. And there's the history of mantra in India is one of the most amazing topics. Um, there's this incredible understanding of the power of language in, in the Vedic tradition and moving right through the tantric traditions. Um, but one difference and one um, novel understanding of mantra that emerges in Shaiva Tantra is that the mantra is the form of the deity. It's the sonic embodiment of the deity. And mantras are then used to install deities into mandalas, and very importantly, to install deities into the body of the practitioner. And so that practice is called nyasa, where you touch your body and repeat mantras. And those mantras actually correspond to the different parts of the deity. And it's almost like you're mapping the mantric form of the deity onto your own body. Um, this is a practice, nyasa. So you have this new kind of repertoire or um, sets of practices for deity worship. And at the heart of them is this really fundamental principle, which is actually true of, of almost all tantric traditions. You can really generalize it, which is, uh, an identification with the deity as a ritual identification and practice that is seen to be purifying. So even before you worship the deity in a mandala um, with a set of mantras and, and forms in traditional forms of worship of offering flowers and incense and food offerings and all these forms of reverentially um, lustrations of the deity, um, you first worship the deity in the space of the body. And this is an empowering and purifying identification, even if certain tantric traditions believe that the deity is a separate reality. Um, other tantric traditions are non-dual, so they think that the self and the deity are ultimately one reality. Regardless, they all involve identification with the deity as foundational. And there's this uh, dictum taught, shiva uh, bhutva shivam yajeta, which means having become Shiva, worship Shiva. And that's this really important principle that's at the heart of tantric traditions, um, regardless of their metaphysics or their cosmology. Um, in addition to that, there's one of the most important things is that tantric traditions were initiatory. They, they involved initiation. And that means in a certain sense, they're esoteric. They're not originally classical tantra, was not open for anybody. It was really for people who were prepared, were deemed to be prepared for these teachings and practices and who went through a process of uh, preliminary initiation called Samaya Diksha, and then a period of time where they're, they're really seeing if you know, this is the path for them. And then Nirvana Diksha, liberating initiation. And this, these initiations empower you, they 
it's it's really one of the most fundamental ways to appreciate classical tantra. They prepare you to receive the teachings, he, learn the scriptures. Um, the idea is that these these teachings um, and these transmissions are only open to initiates. You have to be prepared by initiation to receive it. So there's an emphasis often on secrecy, um, but they also um, open you into this community of fellow initiates. And there's a certain code of conduct that, that you, and certain sets of vows that you would make traditionally. Um, but most importantly, the act of initiation itself, Nirvana Diksha is understood to liberate the practitioner. Now, not like once and for all, there's no more work to be done liberation, um, but rather a kind of fundamental loosening of the bonds or singeing of the bonds that keep people in conditioned existence or samsara or you know in cyclical existence. Um, there's this idea that initiation is this act, it's this bestowal of this gift, which is a gift of a lifetime. Uh, and it's an act of grace um, of Shiva himself through the vehicle of the guru or the teacher of the master. The initiating guru and that by receiving that even if you're not liberated that moment there are certain rare initiations where that might happen for certain rare ripe souls <laughs> uh, at some point you will be liberated and there's some way in which you have an initial immersion in liberation in that moment and there's even an idea that it's almost as if all of the momentum of your karma, your past actions is actually played out in the um, drama or in the unfolding of the initiation that even future births in other worlds and other times and places are actually kind of sped up and enacted so that you can actually be free of all of those momentums. That's all understood to be encapsulated originally in the ritual of initiation, but then in more charismatic traditions, it could be, uh, initiation could just be the touch of a guru or the glance of a guru or the word of the guru, which is giving the, the mantra, for example, or even the willpower of the guru, um, which opens up the possibility of initiation when you're not even in the presence of the guru, or it's just the guru's will. Um, because there's this emphasis on this initiation, not just being a right of entry into a community, but being fundamentally liberating. Uh, diksha being fundamentally liberating. And the guru is the vehicle for that process. There's also in classical tantric traditions, an incredible reverence for the guru. Um, there's something called guru yoga. The guru is seen as the deity and the guru is worshiped and honored as a deity in many different ways. Um, and that's, you see forms of guru bhakti or devotion to the guru that are really intensified within tantric traditions. Um, and there's incredible respect uh, for the guru and, and deep gratitude because they're the agent for this powerful uh, intervention within our karmic streams, so to speak, you know, that's fundamentally liberating. Um, so that kind of naturally emanates as well from tantric traditions. Um, there's also just to say maybe one more thing. Um, yeah, their early Tantra, uh, early Shaiva Tantra was more ritualistic. And there was a certain transformation that happened across centuries. These traditions emerged as early as like 450 CE or the fifth century CE. And around the eighth in ninth century CE, there was a sudden uh, transformation in the traditions that um, moved away from ritual and away from outwardly uh, worshiping deities to um, understanding ritual and even yoga as metaphors for internal processes of awakening. It's a kind of trans ritual mysticism where you can bypass the, the the rigmarole of ritual <laughs> and commune with the deity 
directly through different awareness practices, through different modes of knowledge, through understanding that it's not about repeating the mantra a thousand or a million times, but understanding the nature of the mantra and then as one's own self and as the deity, and therefore one repetition teaches you that the mantra just is that liberated awareness that is um, at the dynamic source of creation. So um, another example, instead of offering oblations into a fire called Homa, um, which is actually involved in some early tantric ritual, um, what you're offering is your individuality to the fire of consciousness. And your own individuality dissolves into that fire until you experience yourself as the entire universe dissolves in that fire of consciousness. And so there's, there's these ways in which rituals become metaphors for internal awakenings or internal recognitions. And that, that tradition, um, in, the, in the wake of that tradition, you get these really interesting non-dual philosophies where the deity is in fact the self. Um, the temple is our own body. The, um, the goddesses and gods that surround the deity are the powers of our own senses, right? And so there's this way in which <clears throat> the body is reimagined in really powerful ways. Pilgrimage places are not actual physical geographical places. They're all mapped onto the body itself. Um, so there's this idea of the tantric body. It includes chakras, um, different chakra systems or chakras as it's sometimes pronounced. <laughs> um, kundalini, uh, this kind of divine alchemical energy that moves through the body is, is seen as a goddess, uh, an embodied uh, goddess. Um, that also emerges in tantric traditions and is developed later in hatha yoga and is often, you know, is really important concept now too in many different Hindu-based traditions and yoga communities. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> that's a, maybe I'll stop there. <laughs> that's a, a kind of big picture toward a force of some outlines. Yeah, and for those um, who may not be familiar with the term Tantra, how would you define that? Um, I know you mentioned there are texts that are known as Tantras, but how would you describe, um, would that be the key definition here that we're looking at that makes something tantric, that it came from one of those texts, or um, could you define tantra in other ways? That's a great question. Um, there's a lot of scholars who have had difficulty trying to define tantra <clears throat> because there's a lot of different diverse forms of traditions, and there's some traditions that have some features of Tantra, tantra, uh, like a Tantric tradition, but then they don't have other features. And so there's outliers. And um, one, one, one way to approach that then, is you say, um, how many, if there's a certain number of these prototypical features, <clears throat> these common features, such as a kind of scriptural basis of texts that are identified as Tantras, such as an understanding of initiation, which is liberating, such as this understanding of mantras as deities, mantra devatas, use of mandalas, use of yantras as well, which I didn't ma uh, mention, different forms of worship and the this foundation of identification with deity as the center. If they have, if you have like, if you hit a bunch of those, if you tick off a bunch of those boxes, you're likely in a tantric context, right? But what's interesting is that a lot of tantric teachings and practices were later absorbed by non-tantric traditions. So if you go to a temple in India, or of course a, there's many temples in America now as well, Hindu temples, a lot, some of the things they'll do in those temples under the name of a non-tantric identity will be tantric ritual. And so what, one of the things that happened is a lot of these technologies and a lot of these teachings and practices um, became diffuse and they started to permeate and perfume other lineages. And so it, it actually becomes a difficult question. And then of course we have um, Tantra, Neo-Tantra, which is uh, identified with sacred sexuality, which often has very little to do with 
um, classical Tantra as it developed in South Asia, although there might be some connections here and there. Um, but it's really um, a, a tradition with its own lineage, with its own esoteric roots that emerged in Europe and in America. And it calls itself Tantra, right? And that's what a lot of people understand by the term. It's become a buzzword. Um, and so that creates a lot of confusion. Um, and uh, you can tell by the criteria that I've given for what makes a classical tantric tradition that a lot of those things are probably not found in these um, neo-tantra communities. And I, I personally don't have anything against neo-tantra communities. I have friends and people, colleagues who are, have been transformed by those practices and engaged in them. It's just that there's a distinct lineage that's not directly connected to this incredibly vast and deep movement of traditions within South Asia um, that have certain continuities. Um, Buddhist Tantra or Vajrayana is much more institutionally and well-developed, globally appreciated as like a kind of, you know, a religious tradition. Um, but there are still Shaiva and Shakta lineages in India and globally that are true Tantric traditions. So um, I, I think those are some of the main ways of making this, dis distinct, this distinction between classical Tantra and neo-tantra. We could go more into that, but that's, that's some of the ways of saying, do we have a classical tantric tradition or something else that people are just calling tantra? <laughs> okay, thank yeah. you. Um, my next question is about the who are the main uh, characters in the world of tantra and classical tantra and Shaiva tantra in particular, um, as far as authors and texts. Well, what's great about it, <clears throat> the field of tantric studies, is that there is a vast, uh, a vast um, uh, group of characters and texts, uh, many of which have never been translated. <clears throat> not only not translated, but not even edited. Um, it's the, if you compare it to Hatha Yoga, and you're probably familiar with the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, um, the Hatha Yoga corpus of texts is, you know, there's a number of texts um, and it's dwarfed by the tantras. Not only the number of texts, but the length of the texts. Some of these tantric texts are just voluminous. Um, and so you kind of, the next step I would do if we were in like, if we were taking a class together on Hindu tantra, is I would identify here are the main streams of Hindu Tantra. And there's Vaishnava Tantras that are dedicated to Vishnu. There's many that are goddess-centric traditions or Shakta Tantras with Kali is at the center of those or different form, Tantric forms of Kali. There's even within Shaiva Tantra, there's a beneficent um, form of Sadashiva who um, loves uh, lacto-vegetarian offerings and is benevolent and calm. And then there's Bhairava, more wrathful tantric deities, and there's traditions that center on Bhairava. So one of the best ways to organize this in one's mind and appreciate it is by the central deity. And also, is that central deity male or female? And is that central deity um, benevolent, wrathful, or terrifying? utterly terrifying. And there's some of those as well. <laughs> Another interesting thing about tantric traditions is you have wrathful deities and, and how those work psychologically. They're, they're often depicted within these really dramatic, um, powerful environments of the charnel ground. There's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of imagery of death and skulls for example. And so that's one stream of Tantra. Often people identify Tantra with those more transgressive, antinomian, uh, left-handed forms of practice. But then there's also much more staid and traditional and orthodox forms of Tantra that involve all those features I mentioned, but they don't use, you know, ritual substances that go against the norms of society. They use lacto-vegetarian, which means like milk products and you know, that, that kind of thing for making offerings. And those deities, that's, those are the offerings that those deities like. 
Okay, so one thing is you have many different streams of Shaiva Tantra. But, uh, you know, then you have what you, what you could call as a post-scriptural period. So it's like the, the scriptures are compiled and there's, then there's a process of commentaries being written on the scriptures, independent works based upon the scriptural knowledge. The scriptures themselves are seen to be revelatory teachings, but then you have human authors who come in and are, are sometimes um, elaborating those teachings for their communities, um, just as a guru would teach a scripture and then give discourses and take questions, you know, and the text, we have textual records of those kinds of like pedagogical moments, but you also have very learned traditions that where you have tantrikas who are scholastics and tantrikas who are interested in poetics and other traditions or have other trainings and capacities who are really developing, creatively developing the tradition. So amongst those post-scriptural authors, um, I work on one who's pretty well known named Abhinav Gupta. Um, in terms of Shaiva Tantra, he's one of the more well-known authors um, and celebrated authors. Um, but he himself, uh, what's interesting about him is he writes a lot, a lot about his own life and, um, and about who he studied with and the lineages of teachers that he, um, the lineages he received. And so if we, if we look at kind of the um, constellation of masters that are in the background of Abhinav Gupta, there's some very important ones um, with, this would be within the Kashmir reception of tantric traditions. Um, one is Vasugupta, to whom the Shiva Sutras was revealed. Another is his disciple Kalata Bhatta, who likely wrote the Spanda Karikas, the stanzas on vibration. Then you have Utpala Deva, who, and Somananda and Utpala Deva, who really founded this school of Shaiva, non-dual Shaiva philosophy, which is based on tantric revelation, but is written as a, a text that's debating Buddhist philosophers. It's kind of taking these teachings from the, you know, esoteric, in some ways, arcane world of the tantras and bringing it out into this public or more public domain of interreligious dialogue and debate um, and philosophy, which in India is deeply dialectical. Um, and so, Somananda Utpaladeva, Lakshmana Gupta, Abhinav Gupta, we have that lineage. Um, you also have a number of other earlier Tantra uh, authors in the dualistic tradition of Shaiva Tantra, which is more orthodox. Um, you have Sadio Jyotis, who wrote many really important and amazing texts. Um, Ramakanta, um, uh, Narayana Kanta, his father. And then you have these South Indian, um, you, have, you have great tantric teachers and masters all across the subcontinent. Um, I'm kind of like emphasizing some that I teach, that I study, because I'm I work mainly on medieval Kashmir, but in the earlier traditions that inform it. But um, in South India, you have Agora Shiva Acharya, um, and you have many, many other great um, teachers in the Sri Vidya lineage. <clears throat> you have um, uh, a number of really important teachers. Um, Shivananda is one who wrote many different important texts on the worship of the Sri Chakra and Sri Vidya tradition and different liturgies to the Sri Chakra and the esoteric meanings or the inner meanings of those liturgies. Um, and that's a tradition dedicated to Tripura Sundari. Um, and you have uh, Amrita Ananda Yogin, who's in that lineage, another author I've been working on lately, who wrote a really important commentary on one of their scriptures, the Yogini Hridaya. So yeah, be, every lineage has its own um, communities um, of great beings who transmitted these traditions. And they there's a practice as well of honoring the entire lineage uh, ritually as well. And spe especially in certain Shakta traditions, the Siddhas or the masters or the Yoginis, there's also female lineage holders in Tantric traditions, which is an, an interesting innovation in the history of Indian religions. Not just uh, female teachers or gurus, 
or gurvi, but actually lineage holders. Um, so you, you have this practice of, of calling them to mind, the entire lineage, and honoring them, and that being a step in even in your daily tantric practice, and sometimes are even visualized within the mandala, um, these masters. Um, there's also, oh, I will say one, one other really important master, uh, Machandanata, who comes to be called Matsyendranata. Machandanata um, is really important. Um, it seems to be associated with this this deep reformation or transformation of tantric traditions I alluded to where they become internalized. Um, it's called the Kula Marga. And he also becomes important later in Hatha yoga traditions. He's really seen as one of the first human gurus of that lineage. And his uh, disciple is Gorakshanata uh, or Goraknat in Hindi. And so Gorakshanata um, probably lived around the 12th century CE, but the, the original tantric Machandanata was much earlier likely. So there's a way in which Hatha Yoga kind of develops um, its own lineage, some of its own lineages, some of the traditions that comes to be called the Nat lineage or the Natas that are, are kind of picking up uh, from this earlier Machandanata, this earlier figure. And he's a really fascinating figure and very, very important in the tradition. Abhinava Gupta in the beginning of his magnum opus has this benedictory verse to him. Um, so there's a recognition that he's really this avataraka or someone who's revealed this new um, uh, sets of teachings that are even novel within the tantric universe. Uh, and, and that tradition also emphasizes the agency of individual awakened masters within the propagation of the tradition. So, um, but yeah, there's there's so many other great, great beings that it's like, I can never do justice to, it's, it's a vast, vast tradition. I, I hope you're all getting a sense of that or intimations of that, yeah. <laughs> yes, I was waiting to, um, to for Matsyan, Matsyan and Dranatha to come up or Matsyanatha, oh. Uh, because that's where I had first encountered Tantra myself in my yoga path and mm. um, the kind of the blending of some of the Tantric concepts into Hatha yoga. Um, yeah. Would you say, and I'm just curious about this, you know, there's been a big revival or a booming of yoga in the West. Would you say that's also happened with uh, the Shaiva Tantra lineages or studies? I, I, it could just be my own exposure to yoga that it seems more recently that there's sort of a lot of attention being paid to, to tantric texts and study. And there are more and more scholars who are uh, not only scholars, but scholar practitioners out there. Um, and could you share your thoughts on that with us? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, I recently um, gave a paper on the history of Naropa University and contemplative education and the contemplative study of Indian religions. And I was looking at the counterculture, um, which if, of the 60s and 70s, Naropa, my, the university I teach at was founded in 1974. And, and I read this article by Jeffrey Kripal, a professor who's worked on um, Tantra in Bengal a little. He worked on Ramakrishna and a little, he wrote a book on him, but he's then moved on to really look at the reception of these traditions of Hinduism and Buddhism in the West. He wrote this beautiful article called Remembering Ourselves, which is about the role of the kind of countercultural history of tantric studies in the West. And he makes this argument, which is really compelling and illuminating, that if you look at the history of the America and Europe's reception of Indian religions. Um, the early, earlier waves of that were primarily um, focused on Vedanta and certain forms of modern postural yoga. There was a lot of, it's, the more we've learned, there's, there's a lot of um, yogis in America, actually, <laughs> even before 1965 when immigration really opened up. And so but it's around the 60s that you have a sudden turn. And, and in terms of Buddhism, there was a real emphasis 
there was some Pure Land Buddhism that came through, but there was a, the earliest teachers were primarily Zen teachers. And um, although there are some tantric elements of Zen, it's, it's more firmly a Mahayana tradition within Buddhism. And, and around the 60s, there's in the reception of these traditions, there's a sudden turn in interest to Tantra. And it's a turn in interest that is happening with very little knowledge of classical Tantra. Our knowledge from that time till now has, has really come a long way. And that's been through the, the auspices of Tantric studies as a field and how it has flourished. But suddenly you have people focusing and interested in the counterculture and who are really in, you know, really open-minded and receptive to these traditions. Um, not less in, in Vedanta and more in Shaiva and Shakta Tantra and less in Zen or Theravada and more in Vajrayana. And this actually ties to the roots of Naropa because Chogyam Trungpa, who founded our university, who's a Tibetan tulku in the Kagyu lineage, he's really one of the first Vajrayana teachers in America to really establish a center. And so he was a, a surrounding him or swirling around him and the birth of Naropa and just within the counterculture was this sudden fascination with Tantra. And um, I think in the wake of that in the eighties and nineties, there was a lot of, there was a lot of teachers. There was a kind of revival of Kashmir Shaivism and an interest in Kashmir Shaivism. Um, and there was also a lot of guru scandals that happened in the eighties and nineties. And, and Kripal argues that there was a lot of disorientation around that. And he sees that the burgeoning of the field of tantric studies is related to these processes. And that whether or not, I mean, I myself was born in 1977, so I can't say that I was there, but whether or not we were part of that countercultural process or not, it, it's a part of who we are. It's a part of the possibility of this deep interest in tantra. And and I think there's a lot of people, you know, I myself grew up in a ashram community. I met a, an Indian guru who was a part of a lineage of tantric teachings when I was eight years old. You know, like there's, there's, it's been here for generations and my, my natural reference points are much more as a child are much more naturally attuned to Shiva than they are to Jesus, you know, <laughs> just as a child, that's the community I grew up in. And so it, there's also my generation coming of age and some of us um, becoming scholars, having been practitioners first. There's other people who were scholars first, but then really became moved or transformed by the, you know, like the tradition, you know, if you're that deeply fascinated with it, it can't be utterly, you know, uh, anesthetic or something, you know, like it, there has to be some kind of connection. Um, and so, yeah, there's, I would say that within tantric studies, there's a, a small but rich community of practitioners. And there's also some, a lot of scholars doing great work who are not practitioners. I mean, fa phenomenal work. Um, but there, these worlds have collided. <laughs> and um, it's, it's really interesting to see how the expanding um, scholarly understanding of the histories is informing the traditions and the traditions own self-understanding and vice versa, how um, the traditions are infusing and informing the people who are dedicating their lives to study these things and to read these texts and to do this, this work, you know? of reconstructing these histories. Um, so yeah, I, I feel very blessed to have, to be a part of um, a network of, of friends and colleagues um, and to teach at a university where I'm invited to be a scholar practitioner and, you know, um, and to let both of those dimensions of myself um, shine in the same place at the same time. <laughs> you know? Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Um, let's open it up to questions. I have on my iPad, the uh, Facebook feed is live. And there's a question there that I'd like to ask. And it's about Ananda Murti. Um, it's asking, have 
if you know of Ananda Marga and Ananda Murti, and do you consider this tradition part of what you're discussing? Yeah. Um, great. Thank you for that question. I have a dear friend who is a part of this path. Um, and I, to be honest, it's a tradition that I'm not that familiar with. And I do, have not had much exposure. I, and it's actually not even a dear friend. It's more of an acquaintance. Um, but in conversations with that person, I think it was pretty clear that there are there are not only tantric roots and elements of the tradition, but an explicit identification of the tradition with Tantra. Um, what, so, so the short answer is yes. You know, if a tradition identifies as tantric and has tantric teachings and elements and draws on these texts, then it's hard to say that it's not tantric, right? Um, the, one thing I'll just mention, so uh, again, I, I don't have as much knowledge of this particular path. It's funny because I'm deeply familiar with many contemporary paths. I just haven't really looked into this one in particular. But I will say that um, there is still a distinction to be made with some classical traditions, um, because if you go back to this classical period, it's a really interesting point, actually. Um, if you're a Shaiva Tantrika, and you meet a Vaishnava Tantrika who's devoted to Vishnu, you see them as actually being a part of a different tradition. And what happened is at a certain point, all of these non-Buddhist traditions and you know, non-Jain traditions and non-Islamic traditions all became umbrellaed or un under this thing called Hinduism, right? But if you go back to a certain time in history, there is this thing called the Shaiva religion. And although it shares much more with a Vaishnava Tantrika or someone devoted to Vishnu, right, than it does with a Buddhist tradition, nonetheless, um, they did not identify with each other as a part of the same community. And, and yet you have this process, and a lot of people have discussed this, is a kind of, there's a book called Unifying Hinduism which is about how this process unfolded historically. And there's some really good scholarship and debates and nuancing of that book by Andrew Nicholson, that where a process whereby these traditions that have shared more in common came to have a shared identity. And that became really the, the birth of a Hindu identity. And a lot of the communities that are global Hindu-based communities today you know, they have, for example, if they have Nama Sankirtana, if they're chanting um, the names of God, of course they're chanting to, you know, Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, right? They're not just doing to Shiva, right? They'll have Hanuman chant, right? There's this idea of like, yes, this is all of these traditions are, there's an expanded um, identity of all of these traditions are a part of us. And so, you could call it eclecticism, but it's really just an expanded um, religious identity. It includes bhakti traditions. It includes often the teachings of Vedanta. It looks back to certain Indian philosophical systems and says, oh, these are the shut darshana, the six paths of Indian philosophy. Historically, those traditions were separate, um, but now they're seen to be a part of one broader identity. And so all of that, uh, are all of those are really important developments and changes um, that distinguish uh, tantric teachings in that milieu from classical tantra before that happened. I hope that's clear. It's it's a really it's a subtle point, and it's really important actually when you look when you look back at these traditions, because sometimes what happens is a kind of modern Hindu identity is projected back into the past. Um, but actually there's, uh, I, I read these texts all the time where it's like, don't, you know, the Shaivas are dissing the Vaishnavas and the Vaishnavas hate the Shaivas. Right. <laughs> and, you know, they get these like really interesting kind of polemical, uh, dynamics and sometimes they're creative too. You know, it's not all just dissing the religious other, you know, but, um, yeah. Uh, I would like to open it up to questions. If anybody has any questions, you can 
raise your hand um, on the screen if you're here on the call live. And I can answer this one question in the chat um, as well. Okay, uh, Teresa has a question here as well. Go ahead, Teresa. Um, I think you're muted. We can't hear you. I, I, I'm asking when is this religion started in India? Is this extension of Buddhism? And also, is this ever went to China uh, in the early age? Sure, great, great question. So um, I have studied um, Buddhism and Buddhist Tantra to a certain extent. Um, it's not my, my main area of special, specialization. The roots of when did Buddhist Tantra emerge in India um, are, it's, not, it's not clearly determined, but we, I think we can say that we have clear signs of Buddhist, Indian Buddhist Tantric traditions around the fifth century CE. Um, and there's these texts called the Charya uh, Tantras and the Kriya Tantras and then the Yoga Tantras. But the Charya and the Kriya Tantras, which are texts that have like a, a lot of different um, magical spells and things that you don't find in early Mahayana Buddhism. And then this, there's this basically emergence of this tradition in Buddhism called Mantra Naya uh, or Mantra Yana, the vehicle of mantras. And that uh, that's, comes to be synonymous with Vajrayana. Um, that tradition um, flourishes in India for centuries until Buddhism actually eventually kind of disappears from India. Um, which is a, another interesting process. Part of Buddhism's transmission, as you know, is, is very early on transmissions to China and Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka, and also all the way to Afghanistan and um, what is now Pakistan and Tibet, and now globally. But um, th in terms of the traditions that went to China, um, they were... Uh, originally more Mahayana traditions that were transmitted there. Um, and although there are were tantric texts and teachings that were transmitted to China, what really landed and, and became established there were more Mahayana traditions. Um, and so this includes forms of traditions that come to be called Pure Land Buddhism, but also Chan Buddhism, which then has become Zen Buddhism in Japan. Um, there is, there are elements of Tantra um, in this transmission, and there are elements in the history of Chinese Buddhism and in Japanese Buddhism. So I, I do want to be really clear about that. But predominantly, it's less of a Tantric form of Buddhism that flourishes in China and Japan. However, what is transmitted to Tibet is purely the Tantric Buddhism, you know, and so Tibetan Buddhism is thoroughly tantric and it identifies as Vajrayana Buddhism. Of course, within Tibet, there's many schools and, you know, um, and many different forms of tantra. Um, and there was a debate that happened in Tibet that was really consequential, which is famous historically, where they had a, a representative from China who, and a representative from India, and they were debating these different forms. What is, what is the best form of Buddhism? And it was really kind of a debate between certain forms of Chan Buddhism as taught in China and then the methodologies of this Indian Tantric Buddhism. And the winner of the debate um, was basically going to be the, the vassal or the, the connection to the transmission of Buddhism into Tibet. And the Indian Tantric Buddhists won the debate. And so Tibet at that moment, there's, there was a few transmissions of Buddhism to Tibet, but Tibet at that moment turned to India and away from China. There was still a relationship to China and there's still Chinese teachers who would come to Tibet, but the main transmission of texts and traditions and lineages came from India. And so um, in terms of Buddhist Tantra, that's probably the most vital uh, living tradition is broadly speaking, Tibetan Buddhism, yeah.
but there are there's there's some studies on Japanese tantra, uh, Buddhist tantra, and there are elements in in China as well. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Teresa. Yeah. There's a uh, there's a great question in the chat that I'd like to read for you. It's what is the end product or realization of practitioners of tantra? How does he or she live, act, and view the world? That's a wonderful question. Thank you for that, Shiv. Um, so the, one of the things that tantra, tantric traditions um, say the goal is, is, of course, liberation, um, moksha. Um, but there's also an emphasis upon siddhi or um, attain, uh, attainment um, or empowerment. And sometimes it's termed bhoga which means enjoyment, but not just enjoyment of things in this, like enjoying like really good coffee or, <laughs> you know, whatever things in this world, but supernatural enjoyments, meaning being able to enjoy subtler and subtler realms of experience within the kind of the vast subtle uh, architecture of the cosmos. And these two goals actually of, of moksha and siddhi um, most tantric texts say that these teachings and this transmission can, um, can give you both. However, um, some, there's certain uh, practitioners who, who gravitate towards one over the other historically. And the ones who gravitated towards Siddhi um, were sometimes actually, interestingly, called sadhakas which now just means a general seeker or practitioner, right? Or yogis, interestingly. Um, sometimes the, the, a tantric yogi is someone who is doing, uh, using mantras to actually achieve certain powers that are, that are part of this universe and world. On the liberation side, um, there's, different, there's different teachings on what liberation comprises. There's this really great text. It's a tantric work called the Paramoksha Nirasakarika, which means the stanzas on the refutation of uh, teachings of moksha according to other traditions. And it gives 20 different definitions of moksha and it refutes them all. And then it says, this is what moksha truly is, right? And so moksha, um, there's different ideas of moksha they, I think they all agree that it's dukkanta. It's the anta of dukkha. It's the end of suffering, right? But there's an idea of, uh, in the introduction to this book, which was edited and translated by Alex Watson and Dominic Goodall um, and Anjanea Sharma. Um, there's, this, I, there's this great analysis of different I, basic uh, types of liberation. One is freedom from right? So being free from is kind of transcending this world, right? It's being free from it. Um, it's, it means you're free from all involvement in the world and you're, you're resting in some kind of transcendental repose beyond the maelstrom of reality, right? And you're never going to be sucked back into it again, right? And so this is kind of like a, a very transcendental emphasis on moksha, but then there's models of moksha, which is freedom for or freedom to. And these are the ideas that there's this idea that emerges. Uh, you may have heard of Shiv called Jivan Mukti or liberation while living. And this is, a, this is an idea that it's not a kind of state that you achieve after you die, but it's actually an embodied liberation. Even though you have a body and the body itself is conditioned by time and space and cause and effect, it's no longer an obstacle to, to fully liberated awareness. And in fact, part of that libera liberated awareness is identification with the deity. So it's the deity, what the deity is, is this unlimited power of agency and knowing and creativity. And so there are certain tantric models of revelation that emphasize this, this kind of flowering or blooming of our capacity to know and to act in the world. And that being like a kind of, uh, that being an, an embodied process. 
And, and not only is the body not an obstacle, and it's partly because there's a new understanding of the body and you could say a sacralizing or sacralizing of the body in these tantric traditions, but the world's no longer an obstacle either. It's not something that must be transcended or you must be free from. And so the world now becomes a kind of vehicle or a medium for expressing one's enlightened awareness or liberated awareness and agency. And, um, and that's a part of a play. Uh, it's, not you, it's not your individual control or, of reality. It's more of your utterly liberated participation in the dynamic and infinite play of consciousness. That is reality. Um, and so those traditions, um, moksha is very different than it is maybe in what Shankara taught in Advaita Vedanta, um, which is being free from and resting in this Brahma, this absolute reality in which there's no change, there's no time, right? There's no manifestation, um, this kind of eternal still point, uh, you know, immutable reality forever beyond uh, karma. And so this, there's this idea of, of moksha that's more grounded in imminent reality that is really, for me personally, compelling. <laughs> and I, I think also for a lot of people um, in, in our time and in our culture who um, are less aesthetically oriented towards life, less of that monastic impulse, right? Less focused on renunciation of life and more grounded in life and, you know, in, <laughs> in trying to Im improve it for ourselves and others <laughs> and maybe even the species on this planet, <laughs> that these models, they, they're, they're more imminent. They actually kind of map on, I think, a little better to modern experience. I have, I have some friends who are, who are actual spiritual teachers in these lineages and, and they find that there's a resonance of these traditions for householders, for, for people who are living in the world and uh, who have families. And interestingly, a lot of the tantric masters I mentioned were householders, they had families, they, they were not monks. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully uh, that covers it, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I have a question about, um, for people who might be watching and wondering how they, you know, how do they, either two, two different questions, really, I'm going to sort of pose at the same time. But if somebody is not at all in the world of yoga, um, because I think a lot of people hit upon Tantra after they've been studying yoga for a while. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So someone with no yoga background, how would they go about studying Tantra? Is, is there, you know, how might they find a teacher? And then again, someone who is in the yoga world, um, maybe they don't know. Um, you, it's not every day that you go to a yoga class and there's any mention of Tantra. Mm -hmm. So how would you propose that someone, whether they're a yogi or not, or a practitioner of yoga or not, how might they learn more about Tantra? Sure, be happy to speak to that a little. Um, well, you know, Within Buddhism, there's there's like a lot of resources and traditions and lineages and teachers and practices and institutions uh, in America and Europe and in India, uh, where you have the Buddhist community, uh, the refugee community in India. A lot of the original monasteries from Tibet were rebuilt in India. So for those of you, you know, I've actually visited some of those monasteries in India myself and connected with those communities. So that's one way is is if, if one feels a connection to Tibetan Buddhism to learn more um, of that particular development of Tantra, you know, and a lot happened once Indian Buddhist Tantra landed in Tibet, centuries of things happened. So that's a very particular tradition. In terms of uh, Shaiva Tantra and Shakta Tantra, there is this book that is very accessible um, that a, a friend of mine and colleague wrote called Tantra Illuminated. Uh, his name's Christopher Wallace. And a lot of people, even a lot of my students at Naropa University have found it really helpful. Um, it's, it's really written for somebody who's, who's completely new to these traditions. And it really helps make some key distinctions. And um, 
he, uh, Chris Wallace uh, or Harish went to on to write another book called Recognition Sutras, um, which is actually a translation of a classical non-dual Shaiva tantric text with a very clear commentary. Um, in terms of finding teachers in, in Shaiva Tantra and Shakta Tantra, it's, it's not quite as simple and straightforward as Tibetan Buddhism. Um, there are some teachers um, in, in some different lineages, um, but it's, it's kind of hard, I, I don't know, I don't, it's kind of hard to find your way in. And there's a lot of mixtures and there's a lot of ambiguity. And that's why it's good to get a, a basic grounding in, in understanding some basic distinctions between classical Tantra and Neo Tantra to then be able to navigate the wild world of things called Tantra. <laughs> yeah, it's funny you know? that you say that. Um, you know, I've been studying yoga over 20 years and it, it was only in the last 10 that I really dove into the Tantra teachings and um, and it just happens that the lineage of yoga that I studied has some Tantra mixed in with it. Mm. And so um, I kind of came about it that way and, and then found Harisha's book, Tantra Illuminated. And that also helped me to, uh, made me really want to go a little deeper and study some of the other texts. And, um, and I have students when I teach about Tantra and, and how it is part of yoga yeah. You want to know more and they want to know, you know, where do, where do I join up? And, and it just, like you said, it's not that easy. It, it seems like it's kind of, I don't want to say an underground community because it's not hidden, but it, it takes a while to find it, I think. And, and maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> you know, the, not, not, not all teachings should be available to everyone and open for, you know, public consumption on with no, no other um, preparation other than having a credit card, you know, um, that there's actually, you know, there's there, I think there was an idea that there's a certain potency to these teachings, right? And there, and because of the potency of these teachings, um, it was really essential to have a solid foundation to embark upon working with them, you know? Um, and so, you know, that, that could sound elitist to some, to some, right? And I think the democratization of a lot of the teachings and knowledge of these traditions is overall a great thing and really important. And it is also for the future of the traditions. But I do, I do think that there are certain teachings that, it, or there are certain aspects of reality that it, it's worth working to try to find, <laughs> you know, that shouldn't just be at our fingertips, you know? <laughs> I understand yeah, and agree. And you actually, you know, then in that, there's a journey, right? <laughs> yeah. That's important. That's really important. Yeah. Uh, Valerie it's has her hand question. up here. Yeah. 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 My yeah. question, I, I don't know anything about yoga or any, but it sounds like you're saying that yoga is uh, a religious practice. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Um. Well, I haven't been speaking about yoga as such to, mm. uh, so much, but there, what I would say is that there's, and I, I didn't actually speak much about yoga within Tantra, which is a really amazing and interesting topic as well. Um, what, what happens is you look at the history of yoga in India, you see that there's many yogas and um often we look to the patron saint of Patanjali and we say, oh, that is, that's yoga, right? But Patanjali was one of many, many teachers of yoga. Mm -hmm. um, and there's even within Buddhism, there's Yogachara, there's the six Naro uh, yogas of Naropa. So there's um, many Buddhist forms of yoga. There's Jain yogas. Hema Chandra wrote the Yoga Shastra. So the Jain tradition had, and so what you start to see when you look at the history of yoga, is that it didn't belong to one religious tradition in particular. Mm. Um, and then what's interesting in, in the history is with Hatha yoga texts, they actually distance themselves from sectarian religious identities on purpose. They're trying to present this. This is happening in like as early as the 13th century CE. They're trying to present a yoga that anyone can practice, 
regardless of their religious identity or affiliation. Mm. So that the Tre Yoga Shastra famously says, uh, it doesn't matter if you're a, a Buddhist or a materialist or a kapalika, right? A skull bearing ascetic. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, it, none of these things matter. Just do the practice. It doesn't even matter what, what doctrines you follow or what your religious worldview is. Do the practice. The practice itself has power, right? Mm-hmm. And that idea, there's a direct through line from that idea right through modern postural yoga. And so there's this way in which there's an emphasis upon practice over belief or in doctrine and mm. religious identity. And that's part of how that's part of yoga's success story, right? That's how it's been able to be, you know, to be transmitted and to be practiced and embraced by people of all of these different religious backgrounds because they're able to integrate it into their lives, right? Um, Now, there's, of course, some people who push back against that and say, no, yoga is Hindu and, you know, (laughs) I don't want my children doing it, you know, or, or there's other you know, people say, yes, yoga is Hindu, you know, and and like Narendra Modi in India, and let's have a yoga day. And this is a part of Hinduism. And that's kind of excluding some people as well. But what's interesting is, as it was taught by some of the pioneers of yoga, like um, Krishnamacharya, Patabi, and his students, Patabi Joyce, right? Um, Iyengar, and Desikachar, and Shivananda, and Kuvalayananda and Sri Yogendra, they taught everyone, including Westerners, regardless of religion, they did it without any emphasis on religious affiliation, even though they, even though Krishnamacharya was a Sri Vaishnava and had that own, his own background, he taught it um, in a non-sectarian way and he empowered Westerners to teach it. And their argument was that yoga was universal, right? And so that's an important part of the history of the transmission of yoga to the West. Um, and what, what one could say is that um, although it's, you can't exclusively tie it to a religion, you can say that it's, um, it emerged within South Asian culture. And so I think part of you know, that is a recognition of that source and the integrity of that source, um, even if it's not affiliated with a particular religion, that there should be a deference to that source. Um, and so what's interesting is that yoga, there's so many forms, it's like constantly changing and per, there's all these permutations and often people are creating their own systems of yoga and making money off of it. And they're doing it completely separated from Indian culture and communities. And so that's where some people might have a sense of, I kind of, that's a bit of a tangent. It's not quite answering your question, but I, I feel like it's relevant part of the conversation for some reason. Yeah. I hope that helps Valerie. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I teach this yoga studies program. So I, I think a lot about yoga and yoga, you know, yoga studies. Uh, and the curriculum surrounding it. So, yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions for Ben while we're still here? All right. Well, thank you so much, Ben. This has been really informative and um, interesting and provoking in some ways to for those who might want to find out more um, study yoga for about 20 years and then <laughs> and you'll eventually hit on tantra no it doesn't take that long um, times have changed a little bit i think it's a little bit more accessible than it was even 10 years ago from from my view i don't know how anyone else feels about that but um definitely um, it's a beautiful path, a beautiful philosophy, a beautiful religion. And um, thank you again for sharing it with us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And thanks for the comments and uh, shout outs of appreciation. It's really been lovely to be with you all.
And, um, and I wish you all best on your continued studies and explorations in this community. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It is more like a science of spirituality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shiv. I appreciate that. Everyone have a great evening.